Hi, welcome to Language in Film, where we take a closer look at how language is used creatively in cinema. Call it. Call it, yes. How do you write the perfect villain? Well, for the Coen brothers, it seemed to evolve in stages. It's hard to imagine a time without Anton Chigurh, the antagonist from the 2007 Coen brothers film No Country for Old Men. I'm convinced it will go down in history as their greatest cinematic achievement with one of the most memorable film villains of the 21st century. Certainly more video essays have been made on YouTube of him than any other movie antagonist, with perhaps one notable exception. Let's not blow this out of proportion. Anton Chigurh is the perfect expression of what I would call the Cohen antagonist. It's almost as though their early films were trial runs where they were feeling out this idea that would eventually culminate with Chigurh. And since No Country, we haven't seen a strong central villain from the directors, like they've had nowhere else to go with the concept. The character of Chigurh was originally invented by Cormac McCarthy, of course, who wrote the book upon which the film is adapted. But that book is written in a very sparse prose, which leaves much to the imagination. And this allowed the Coens to take the character and mold him to fit the archetypal villain we see appear repeatedly in much of their work. Strange as it may seem, Charlie, I, I guess I write about people like you. The average working stiff, the common man. It's worth noting that the Coens also appear to have a favorite archetype for their protagonists as well. We see the Cohen hero, you might call them, repeatedly throughout their filmography. An average person, usually a man, a dude, but not always, beset by chaotic forces beyond their control and struggling to make sense of a harsh, seemingly random, an indifferent universe. These chaotic forces are then personified by the villain, and by overcoming that character, the hero manages to conquer their problems and find their place in the world. In this video, I'd like to go through the Coen Brothers movies leading up to their masterpiece, No Country, and show the evolution of the Coen villain, because it was only through this process of trial and error that we arrive at the end product of Chigurh. Spoilers ahead for these Coen Brother movies, and I'm going to assume that you've already seen No Country for Old Men. So in Blood Simple, their first film, we see echoes in No Country. Both are set in Texas. Both begin with shots of the open landscape and feature an opening monologue. In No Country, it's provided by the protagonist Tom Bell, but in Blood Simple, it's the bad guy who presents us with his philosophy on life. What I know about is Texas. Down here, you're on your own. Both movies feature an amoral killer. In Blood Simple, Lauren Visser is a private investigator, played with relish by M. Emmett Walsh, whose big laugh and jovial smile belie the ruthless hitman underneath, who agrees to kill his client Marty's wife and her lover in exchange for $10,000. Unlike Chigurh, though, Lauren has selfish motivations and human drives typical of such a villain. Greed. Money. He is a psychopathic killer like Chigurh, but self-interested and ultimately human. But instead of killing them, Visser fakes the deaths of the wife and lover to appease Marty, and then abruptly double-crosses and kills him. He takes the money and could just be on his way, but instead decides to go through with the planned double murder. This is echoed later by Chigurh, following through on his promise to kill Moss's wife in No Country, even though there is no practical reason he needs to do so. The Coen brothers' first two movies couldn't be more different in terms of tone, and yet both feature antagonists who contain elements of Chigurh. Leonard Smalls is the antagonist of Raising Arizona, the Coen's second film. Smalls and Chigurh are both manhunters who are paid to track people down, and both spend a good chunk of their respective screen time simply on the trail of the protagonist. As a side note, I remember watching this scene as a kid where a cute bunny rabbit gets blown up with a hand grenade, and it thoroughly traumatized me. So, parenting pro tip, don't take your 10-year-old to see a Coen Brothers movie. In Raising Arizona, Ty's act of kidnapping a child so his barren wife can be a mother 
is what unleashes Leonard Smalls, just as Moss's decision to take the money is what sets him in Chigurh's sights. In a sense, both villains represent the dark side or shadow self of the protagonist. These villains are the consequence of a fallible hero's understandable but self-destructive choices. High struggles to not return to his past life of crime, and Moss makes the morally great decision to take the blood money for himself. Smalls, of course, is more of a caricature that fits in with the madcap comedy style of Raising Arizona, but the parallels between him and Chigurh are pretty obvious. The Coens liked this concept of a predatory killer who tracks down the hero. The hero cannot outrun or evade the inevitable showdown at the movie's climax. No Country, of course, notably subverts this idea with an anticlimax of sorts where Moss is killed before Chigurh can get to him, and Sheriff Bell's encounter with Chigurh is likewise aborted. This is Bell's coin toss, and fortunately for him, it lands face up. The Coens next began working on what would become their third film, my personal favorite of theirs, Miller's Crossing. But they hit a creative roadblock and had problems completing the film. So they paused and wrote the script for Barton Fink, a movie about writer's block. And once finished with that, they returned to and completed Miller's Crossing before then producing Barton Fink as well. Like the first pair of films we just looked at, they're quite different tonally. Miller's Crossing is a period gangster film featuring a large cast of characters, while Barton Fink is a much more contained story with just a few characters and locations. Yet both again, have antagonists which foreshadow the later invention of Chigurh, though admittedly with Barton Fink, it's a bit of a stretch. In Miller's Crossing, we have the Dane, a cold-blooded, humorless, psychopathic killer. Unlike Lauren Visser, there's no contrast between outward appearance and inner malevolence. The Dane is a scowling, sinister presence. He's vicious and menacing and kills when there isn't a need. I believe you. He's a misanthrope who values loyalty and directness above all, and so is particularly rankled by the hero, Gabriel Byrne's character, whom he perceives as untrustworthy and duplicitous. The Dane is also unlike Visser or Smalls from the previous films in his motivation. He isn't after money. It's more about a code of honor with him, and you get this sense of a barely constrained rage and disgust at not only the main character, but most people. There's also this scene where he shoots a thug through the wall of a doorway, which the Coens later reuse in No Country with Chigurh. So like Chigurh, he's a killer who follows a higher code, a warped morality of his own, which transcends simple greed and points instead to a life philosophy about the world and how it should work. Now, with Barton Fink, John Goodman's villain isn't all that Chigurh-like in terms of his personality. But I will point out that he is a serial killer who uses a shotgun and stalks hotel hallways. So I mean, that isn't dissimilar from some scenes we get in No Country. The mid to late 90s were an amazing creative period for the Coens. In a span of five years, we got three incredible films. Fargo in 96, The Big Lebowski in 98, and Oh Brother, Where Art Thou in 2000. With Fargo and The Big Lebowski, you've again got a pair of films that are night and day in terms of tone. The first, a drama. The second, a farce. In Fargo, we have the bad guy, Geir Grimsrud, what a name, played by actor Peter Stormer. Hope I pronounced that right. Again, a brutal psychopath who kills easily, like it's only a minor inconvenience. He kidnaps a woman as part of a plot by her husband, to get the father's ransom money, but Grimsrud then kills her simply for making noise and annoying him. Uh, she started shrieking, you know. He murders five people in cold blood throughout the movie when their presence threatens his plans. These murders he commits are mostly on innocent bystanders, people who just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and make the mistake of accidentally crossing his path. His character I would classify as nihilistic. There's no overarching moral code, it seems. Yes, he's after money the way Chigurh is after money, technically, but it's not his prime concern. It's superficial. 
He doesn't care about it enough to not murder Jerry Lundegaard's wife when she gets too loud, even though that might potentially wreck the ransom. So even though he seems to lack any strong motivation, he's part of this template we've seen thus far in many Cohen films of a killer who is just out of step with other people, who has his own set of personal values, or maybe no values in this case, which conflict with typical social mores and attitudes. There's not one major antagonist like this in The Big Lebowski, but what's funny is that the actor Stormer returns for a cameo as the leader of the weasel-wielding nihilists. He believes in nothing. He believes in nothing, Lebowski, nothing. I think this must be a wink back to the nihilistic behavior of his character in Fargo. And it presages the kind of nihilism we'll soon get in the form of Chigurh. Chigurh's character presents us a strangely formalized, codified nihilism. Grimsrud's murders are random and haphazard, but Chigurh will take this principle of chance and merge it with the moral conviction of the Dane, resulting in a philosophy regarding the indifferent nature of death and the cosmos. We're all at the mercy of the random coin toss. First, though, we get one other minor character who Chigurh will later echo a little, and that's the devil himself in O oh Brother, Where Art Thou? The lawman who tracks down Ulysses and his gang is obviously Satan, and the Coens aren't terribly subtle about that. Tommy meets the devil at the crossroads to sell his soul for guitar lessons and describes the devil as... He's white. As white as you folks. With empty eyes, and he looked trap around with a mean old hound. That's right. So again, like the other examples of antagonists, here is one that tirelessly pursues our heroes over the course of the movie and catches them in the end. All right, then it appears that the Coens took a break from this idea of Chigurh because the next three movies they made, The Man Who Wasn't There, Intolerable Cruelty, and The Lady Killers, don't feature any main antagonist like the ones we've seen so far. But clearly he was still on their mind because this brings us to 2007 and the release of No Country for Old Men. What's so interesting about No Country is the fact that after all these prior movies, when the Coen brothers are finally able to create this ultimate expression of their antagonist, we are then purposefully deprived of the climactic meeting that we've been expecting. We don't even realize that we have this expectation that the hero and the villain have to tangle. Usually the hero wins, sometimes the bad guy does, but at least they have to meet, right? And then, when Sheriff Bell is standing there at the motel door, and we glimpse Anton on the other side, we're thinking, okay, this has to be it. The final showdown. And Bell seems to know this too. And yet he summons the courage to open the door, and then... When I first saw this movie in the theater, I remember being left with an unsettled feeling like I had enjoyed what I'd seen, but that most of it went way over my head. I have since rewatched the movie a dozen times, and in each viewing, I uncover more hidden depth and meaning I didn't see the last time. 